Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Hurdlers of Adversity. We are having another great show. I just welcome you into the room. Come on in the room, play a little piano, open the door, you know, just make sure you close behind you when you come in. Uh, we're having a, we're going to have a fantastic conversation today. My name is John Register. I'm a two-time, two-sport Paralympic athlete, uh, professional female speaker, uh, combat army veteran, and, and, and I just welcome you today for this amazing conversation we're having with a uh, a friend who uh, I'm getting to know more and more, and the more I get to know her, the more I just adore this this person. Uh, our last show, if you didn't get a chance to, to, to check it out, was with Andrew Kirka. Andrew is on our Paralympic team right now. He's about to head over to Beijing. I actually think he's in quarantine right now. But if you're able to look at the, um, the Sports Illustrated, I think it was a month ago, a month or two ago, uh, you would have seen him in his um, uh, model ski uh, on the cover. Of Sports Illustrated, so we we pinned him. I think was pinned to uh, the profile on LinkedIn. So make sure you check him out because he had some really great insight of things to say. The last two guests also we had we had some trouble with Streamyard doing the um, doing their videos, and this time we don't have that problem. So we're going to get a chance to see our guests uh, as you are coming into the studio and as you are coming to listen in. We want your comments. I invite you to just make a comment because I know that our guest today is going to have a lot to say and has a wealth of knowledge uh, to push us into the space of marketing. So uh, help us right now by just doing that. All these episodes I've pushed on LinkedIn profile. So make sure you go and check out those comments, post and share. Uh, hit the notification bell if you're on, on uh, YouTube or, or I think we got uh, Facebook and Facebook groups out there. So make sure you're, you're going and following and push it out to your audience because these are some really great conversations. Um, so anyway, we're not going to, uh, without further ado, because I don't know how much time she has, I want to make sure we get to these questions. Have you ever had a moment in your life when you had to speak to an audience and the person before you was so good, you just had to up your game or crash and burn? <laughs> um, I was in an accelerant business meeting in Indianapolis. I was the keynote speaker and the woman who was up before me brought the house down. I'm like, who is this lady? Why isn't she the keynote speaker? Let me get my notepad out to take some notes. Uh, I knew she was a force to be reckoned with because on the previous night, she destroyed the room again <laughs> in her own room because she was in her own home at, at Valve Meter, uh, a performance marketing company in Indianapolis. Uh, she has received notable recognition for her leadership as president and CEO of Indianapolis-based uh, Defender Direct, now called Defenders. And over the course of her 14-year tenure with that company, Defender Direct experienced ex exponential growth from $2 million to an annual revenue of more than $400 million bucks. Uh, I would say she knows what she's doing. Uh, her wit, her charm are infectious. And as you're going to find out, uh, but her marketing smarts are off the charts. See, I did that marketing smarts off the charts. Uh, she's an influencer. She is a commander. She is the marketing queen with the M. Please welcome the one and only Marsha Barnes. Hey there, John. How are you doing today? I am doing fantastic. Thank you for saying yes and being on today. Well, no one can say no to you, John. You know that. <laughs> <laughs> Tell my wife that. Okay. All right. <laughs> Um, so I want to jump in real quick and because, you know, when I met you, I, I, I told you before, kind of we're in the, in, the, in the waiting room, that there are some people I just meet in life. In the first you know, five seconds that they open their mouth, I said, I need to know that person. She is, this person is awesome. Um, and so you're just one of those, those people. If there is one lesson, you know, for those that might be on just for the, this, the early part of the show, if there's one lesson that you have learned as it pertains to life, as it pertains to marketing, what would that life lesson be? Boy, we're going to go deep right out the gate. Right out the gate. Right out the gate. <laughs> this is John and Marsha into the deep. There should be like a theme song, you know. Um, you know, I really, I really um, wish that I had known earlier in life where my identity came from. That I, mm. it, when I got clear on my identity in God, everything became easier. When I started to understand how I was created, that I've got what it takes, that I'm here to deliver a unique value to this to the kingdom here on this side of heaven when i started to understand that and see myself through his eyes and not people's eyes you know, i might have been trying to impress a boss or a, some you know that person in high school that you want to do better than them all the time right right, right, um, right. Or 
you know, a big part of my early life, probably a lot longer than I should have, but trying to win my mom's approval. You know, these things all created tension and drag in my life and drama and things that weren't moving me in line with God's calling and purpose on my life. And so that really helped me to get results and relationship. Um, you know, most of my life I went until I got to this spot of understanding my identity in God. I had this little voice in my head that's saying, you can't, you won't, you couldn't, you shouldn't. Remember the last time you did that and you failed. You're going to make an ass out of yourself. I'll, sorry about my language, John. <laughs> you know this about me, but I love Jesus and I cuss a little. So I'll, I'll, try, to, I'll try to be be good for you today. But but I, you have we all have that, that little nagging voice, that self-doubt piece and how to quiet that down and really rest in my strengths and the ways that I've been created. Um, the better that I got at that, the easier things became, the more results that I got, the more influence I had, the more I could help other people, the more wealth I created to use the philanthropically. It just all came together. And had I understood that at an earlier stage in my life, that it would have been an interesting, interesting uh, thing to see. Do you think, do you think that you can go even deeper? So here's why we mean that, right? Because, um, for, for me, I discovered that as, as well from, from this standpoint, I was going through a, a veterans entrepreneurship program where I, after going through, I, I got this, they, they gave me this amazing gift, uh, at, after it's over. I, I, I won an award, one, one of the awards I've, I've won. So, uh, I was, I went through, um, this program and this woman, um, her name is Pat Enriquez. She comes in, she's a little short little thing, and, and she challenges the, 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 the group and says, what is the most important thing in business? So all of us are giving our opinions on what the most important thing is, and um, it's, it's marketing, it's it's sales, it's it's the, you got to build contact lists and all these things. She said, the, the most important thing in business is how are you going to wrap up your business? How are you going, what are you going to do after you transition to the next phase of life. And I said, wow, that's, that's a good perspective because at the end of it, what, what I want it to be, because I, I would have been successful. And the, the, so then about six months later, I was still wrestling with, I was wrestling with it. And then I thought about it. I said, what I want to be at the end of my life, uh, for myself, uh, outside of business. And I, you know, then God spoke to me and said, uh, to, I, you know, I, I want to hear my God say, well done, my good and faithful servant enter now to the joy of my rest. And because of that, it shifted everything on how I showed up for people, uh, just in, in just in general conversation. So, for for you, kind of understanding this part of you now, how is it that you can? What is what is there left to do? How is the the legacy of Marsha, you know, going forward to see that you're going to to make make an end state like that? Good, good. Thank you for that. That's a great question. So I too would like to land in this in the kingdom and hear God say, well done, my good and faithful servant. But I also think that the kingdom is on this side of heaven as well, and that we can hear that every day. Um, God invites us into the spaces where he's doing something really interesting and allows us to participate in that. So for me, that might be that I'm giving to a cause or serving on a board for a cause where God's really moving on that. Um, I'm involved with an organization called Youth with a Mission Homes for Hope, mm. Homes of Hope. And we go into Mexico, the Baja Peninsula, so Tijuana, Ensenada, very poverty-stricken areas, and we build homes for the for the for the people who don't have them. You know, Mexico's real estate and construction and loans and all those things are a lot different than the US. And so right. It's very um, difficult for people to um, become a homeowner. And so we go on mission trips and build these homes in two days and um, get this transformational result. But God's doing this fascinating thing in the way that he's showing up. We're sharing God's generosity with a broken world. And God's inviting us into participating in that build. And then, you know, I've led hundreds of business people and youth, youth groups and families down there to build. Wow. And when they go, they're like, okay, I'm going to go give this blessing to this Mexican family. But when they come back and I'm on the bus with the same people, they're realizing they got more out of it than they, than they Absolutely. gave. Right. And I see that on a client level where I don't, you know, I, I am a faith-based um, person and I 
I try to run my business on faith-based principles, but I don't advertise that. I don't ask for only customers that are Christian or of a faith-based nature, but they come in very naturally. And every time that I see that happen, it's God inviting me into their business and what they're doing to help grow their business and create abundance there so that they can fulfill on what he's calling them to do. When my team members join Valve and Meter, same thing happens. God calls them here and they become something different than they were when they got here. If we've done our leadership job well. Um, yeah. So it's, it's, I think we get little glimpses, little tastes, these four tastes in the Psalms. I can't remember what, what verse it is, but there's these opportunities to have that foretaste of what the kingdom will be. And, mm -hmm. and so that connecting to that for me is just huge part of energy driving things for me. Oh, I love you. Just, you just made my day. I mean, just, you, you just poured into me already on this day. So we have one person that says, I don't know if you know Kelly Pettigrew. She says, she I is do. the queen, smartest <laughs> woman I know. <laughs> so oh, thank you, Kelly. I'm beginning to understand that, Kelly. So yeah. <laughs> she, she's you know, Kelly's saying, Kelly's saying I'm the smartest person. She's very talented. On Valentine's Day, I had this beautiful cookie. Oh, my gosh. From scratch. And I thought it was it was packaged so nicely. I thought it was um, store bought, you know, and she said, no, I made that myself. And I'm like, how do you manage a family and your job? And this, you know, blew my mind. She's something. <laughs> but that's great. You know, uh, that's the connection. And that would actually kind of goes in my next question of, you know, many people have shared with me when I was there in Indianapolis uh, that you helped them not just to launch, but have the courage to launch. And I think those are two different things. Um, uh, and they're, all, and they're, they're off on their own businesses and they credit you with watching your journey uh, to kind of explode. What I call it is in, in my, my kind of our business is the inspirational cycle. That inspiration really is the key or the catalyst to motivations. I never call myself a motivational speaker. Uh, so we have to be inspired for it. So inspiration is a catalyst to motivation. Motivation in turn causes actions. Actions lead us to transformational results. And those results, they re-inspire us or allow someone else that's watching the process to catch the vision. So when they watched your process, they caught a vision and they began to uh, to elevate. So as you do that, why is being a mentor so important to you? Well, you know, I grew up as a child in a very um, broken home. We were poor. Um, my mom was addicted to drugs. We were we had abuse going on from her. And the data shows, the math shows that my sisters and I would have a 98% chance of repeating that cycle of being abusive to our children, having addictions, mm. um, being in poverty. And none of us had that happen. All three of us have avoided all, all of those things. And when you look at what is the reason to believe that you can break that cycle, it's all about um, resilience. Mm -hmm. And you get resilience because when you're going through that as a child, people come alongside of you. Like, was there a grandparent who was um, telling you, was um, loving on you? Was there an aunt or an uncle, a Sunday school teacher, a coach, a 4 H leader? Um, the, a neighbor, you know, those, those people who would come into your path and help you get to the next step. And I saw that happen, not just as a child, but all through my life, that when I needed to know something or learn something, God presented the right teacher at the right time. And so I cannot say I got here because I had all those, all those people showing up for me as, a, as, as they were called into my life without being open to that God might call me into somebody else's life. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's, I try to pay attention to that. And, you know, you're a busy person. I'm a busy person. The way I manage my priorities is I ask um, when I'm committing to time on something based on where God is calling me right now, is this the best and highest use of my time? Mm -hmm. And that kind of, that type of prayer into those choices on priorities helps me to know where, and sometimes I just meet somebody randomly like you, that you just connect at that soul level and you know, that God's put us together for a reason, you know? Yeah. Um, wow. That's, that's, that's really strong. Um, you now have a new grandchild. I do. Yeah. Emerson and, Gray, uh, yes. And how, what are the shifts going on right now as it pertains, we talked about the legacy in life, but also now, you know, 
how does that show up with the priorities that you are sharing? Does that shift? Did you see this coming and then started making room and space for this new time? Um, I've stayed unattached to what, how that will define me and what it means and just trying to stay in the experience as it unfolds. I don't know if that makes sense, but yes, it does. I, I find that when I picture something and I get too attached to it, that I get less blessing from it than if I stay open to the way that God's calling me into that new phase of, of oh, so relationship or, or, or my life. But I will tell you, my CFO, Mitch Katz, he told me, I love my grandchildren and he's all the time spending time with them. But he said, the bigger blessing for him has been watching his children be parents. So I was aware of that. And so I've been observing it. And Mitch is right. I mean, these two, you take an RN that works in the ICU at a major hospital and, and she has a baby with a business analyst. What you're going to get is something that looks like a lot of data. So they're like at the child's side all the time with notepads and pencils <laughs> down everything she eats, how much it weighs, how much she sleeps, the, how many diapers, what times of day, well, we're in the diapers, small, medium, or large on the diapers. And so they're, they're all about the data and they are so sweet to observe. John, I know you're a parent too, but they told me they had in the first four days that she was on, on, uh, on this side of the womb, they only let her put her down without holding her for 45 minutes. So I was like, RJ, I'm maybe I owe you an apology. That's not what I did with you, but they're just, they're all in on this learning what they are now as parents and this baby and becoming three instead of two. And that's just, I'm just getting a lot of joy out of watching that, you know? You know, uh, Mitch is hundred percent right. Uh, we have a, a, a grandchild and she runs the house when she gets here. Um, yeah. She's down in Texas. We go down and see her. We just came back to see her uh, to, to spend time with her. But watching my son, uh, because the, the two aren't there together, but watching my my son take the time to be present and to just offer everything that he has to this this child, this person that's growing up, uh, she'll never forget that. And it's it it does my heart great just to to watch him as he grows and matures uh, in this in this process as well. Really? That that's fa fascinating. Um, that, that was great, uh, just wonderful response. You know, you so know, switching I was gears. Go ahead, I was going to add there. Yeah. Um, you know, RJ, we do two weeks paternity leave for dads here at Valve and Meter as a benefit. Six weeks for moms, two weeks for the guys, and I'm very adamant with our team that I don't want to hear from you for two weeks. I don't want to see emails or text messages. This is your time to bond and become a family and, 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 and discover what is new, you know? So I was talking to RJ about this and, and, um, and he would say, well, you know, maybe a few days and then I'm work from home so I could do some stuff. I said, no, really put it all down. And he did that. He really did put it all down. And then Cody said to me on Saturday, She's, you know, she's looking pretty ragged. These are the first four weeks, right? And she's all in and sleepless nights and feedings and all that. And she said, two weeks isn't enough. And so it's causing me to rethink how I think about paternity leave for our guys and our women. So I think that's going to put me on a journey to shift to a different model. So. Yeah. Uh, what, what just triggered for me, I had another person on a show and, um, his name's Noah, uh, and and Noah has a whole different. He's, he's, a, he's a snowboarder, got the long hair. He's, he's a, I love the kid. He's he's just one of these remarkable uh, young young men. He's like 23 now, 22, 23. But he's on. He'll be on a snowboard team, and uh, and he has this beautiful daughter. Her name is Sky Skyler, and uh, and he became a, a teen father. And as part of being a teen father, he's the one that's been raising his daughter from that time. And we never hear about that, right? So what you're doing in that moment is really something that's kind of unconventional, where where fathers are kind of they go out and they're you know you know slay and kill and all this stuff. But and then the but the bonding moment with that child is my I mean my daughter still comes over. Uh, at 25, right. and will rest her, you know, watch a movie and rest her head on my shoulder. 
because of what happened previous and she feels safe and comfortable in that spot and so these are the moments when that takes place so big applause for you for doing that and, and now even rethinking some of that how you want the, the company to respond and you know as uh for that um so switching gears just a little bit you know when did you realize because i mean you've done a lot in the marketing space and you you found a niche there where you just <laughs> you put your finger on the button and it just goes um when did you find that you had a kind of a knack for this space um <laughs> that's funny um third grade so so <laughs> In third grade, um, I had been in the brownies and now I'm a Girl Scout, right? And you're not yeah. allowed to sell the Girl Scout cookies until you're in, and you're not allowed to get, sell Girl Scout cookies until you're out of brownies into the Girl Scouts. And they, I'm looking forward to selling the cookies. I don't know why, but I was. And, and uh, the scout leader says, she's explaining how to do it and fill out the form. And she said, now the record's held by my daughter. And she gave the number and I don't remember what it was. But I, I do remember thinking I could beat that, you know. Well, her daughter lived in town where houses are really close. I lived on a farm where things are miles apart. And my mom was addicted to amphetamines. So she would be awake for two weeks and then asleep for two weeks. And I must have hit her in the sleeping for two weeks <laughs> with the Girl Scout cookies. Because I would get home from school and get on my bike and ride around and sell the cookies. So it came time to um, pick up the cookies. And my... Um, my parents um, had this big, you remember the big giant station wagon that you could put a queen size bed in the back without folding. Yeah, the door opened up this way. Right, right. Yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah. And um, it got like four miles to the gallon and it's in the <laughs> middle of the oil embargo and gas has jumped from 19 cents a gallon to like $3, creating economic hardship on families like ours. And so driving over to, the, to town to pick up the cookies, my mom was not happy about. And then the scout leader and my mom and I were carrying these cookies out to the car and the car, I can remember seeing the boxes fill up the car. And I was like, wow, that's a lot of cookies, you know? And, um, and we couldn't get them all in and mom and Betty Ferguson were trying to push that tailgate shut, you know, on the station wagon. I had to carry two cases of cookies on my lap going home, but we got, we got that car filled up. My mom turned to me and she goes, Marsha, how many damn cookies did you sell? And, and, and the scout leader says, well, the second load is still here and I'd like to be home by dark if you could come back. <laughs> and she just blew a fuse and all the way home, she we're dropping off cookies and, and all these really far away. Like I drive home now and I drive around this area. I sold the cookies and it blows my mind. Wow. You're just miles and miles and miles. But we had dinner that night with my dad and she, my mom's telling him about this. And she goes from Elrod to Pierceville to Delaware to Milan to Stringtown. She's been all over the place. I don't know when she went there, but she sold all these cookies and we don't have gas money. And she's just ranting. So that set into, into and I did win the record. That set into being that every time Girl Scout cookies was mentioned, clear up until my 40s, like you'd go into the store and the little table set there with the Girl Scout my mom said, remember those damn cookies, you know, <laughs> but, uh, but when I came out of college, I, I got my first job I got was a sales and marketing job. I was selling, it was, um, um, it was actually an interim job while I was waiting on another one, but we were at Frisch's having dinner and my mom who never really had that much kind to say to me, she spoke at a cigarette at the table, you know, well, what's this new job you got, you know? And, uh, well, I'm 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 gonna be um, selling advertising over the phone, um, and she goes, "Oh my God, you're gonna be great at that! Remember all those goddamn cookies?" <laughs> <laughs> and she said so many, so few things to me that were nice that I thought, "Gosh, if she thinks that I can be good at this, I kind of went in the next day prepared to learn, follow their process." you know, do my best. Mom thinks I can do it. And, you know, I broke the company's sales record in my first week on the job. Wow. Made $1,500, which today would be more like 3,500 and um, made more money than my dad was making as an engineer at Sigrams. And it was on, I never looked back, but I would go to my grave saying, even in this environment of this abusive type relationship that I had with my mom, she anointed me for sales and marketing in that moment. And then that's just what I always followed that path. 
what do you think? I mean, do you have the anointing for it, Real? Because we all you know how deep we want it. We want that approval from our, our parents and we want to uh whatever we're doing, you know, to have that kind of blessing you're off and, and running and, and, and make it happen. Um what do you think may uh, you know what was it about that that triggered in you, you know, that young of an age that I I can I can do this. You know, I know I can beat that record. Well, I think, yeah, when you're in that abusive environment, you're looking for ways to get approval, right? Yeah. yeah. And so sports and 4-H and ribbons and great beginning straight A's and winning mm -hmm. public speaking contests. You know, I started competitively public speaking when I was 10 years old. You know, I think that's part of you're trying to get noticed and you're trying to do something that somebody says, good job, you know. Mm -hmm. so I think that was a lot of it. Sales can be that way, too, of, of trying to have self-worth through the sales. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I would probably lean that way. Maybe not the healthiest of reasons that that, that no, it's, it's, but, yeah. Well, I, I think, you know, when you talk about healthiest of reasons, you know, I'm a, I'm a military guy. So I, I've been in the military army for six years before I had my accident and I had to get out. But when people ask, you know, they ask me, they say, thank you for your service. Or they tell them, thank you for your service. And, and you know, uh, then they ask, they get started going granular into why'd you get in? Well, I always say because for very personal, selfish reasons. That's why uh, it was you're, you're either running from something or running to something. Yeah. And then we get in, then we kind of okay, I kind of like this. So for me, it was number one to uh, to be. I wanted to continue to run track and field. Right. And the army had a world class athlete program, so it became a means to an end. Mm -hmm. uh, and and then I yeah, of course I went to Operation Desert Shield of the Storm. But the second reason. Was uh, Alice and I were pregnant with our daughter Ashley? Well, she was pregnant. I wasn't pregnant. I was yeah. a guy. So yeah, I got it. <laughs> so, so, so I got I it. Nothing new from you every time I talk. To you. Yeah, I got it. So I went to I went to the military. They I got a paycheck and they paid for my kid to come. So you know, Great. so that you know, I think we're um, I, I think that that running, you know, we don't often go granular like that to say what was the real reason. There's a, a, a pretty prominent business person here and town and um you know, we're, we're talking about um i said i was, I was we're talking powers i had this whole thing around power and status and power rarely yields itself for someone to elevate somebody in status to have power uh and and so uh i won't go into the whole whole story but i but then uh, and so he says no power will all will, will yield itself and i said you know, but it was coming through like a charitable gift a charitable organization or something i said that's really not yielding power that's kind of elevating status with a group and, and doing that. So we're going back and forth. And then I saw it during the Olympic Games, an actual demonstration of when power, proximity, and privilege yield themselves for performance. Mm. And that was during um, the speed skating. I don't know if you saw it, but the, in the 500 meters, Erin Jackson, an African-American woman, that inline skater, Five years after five years is the world's number one speed skater in the she's number one in the world, one's world championship. Her um, her teammate is a, a, a white white um, what's her name Brittany Bow Brittany Bow. Uh, they train in Ocala, Florida, and then in Salt Lake City. So at the trials, Brittany I believe had made the thousand meters. She was on the team, and they, they were skating the the, the five hundred meters together as well. Uh, which is like one of the hardest races in, in ice skating, I guess. Um, and uh, Aaron has a stumble. She, she kind of falters and finishes third, which is off the, the team. So she's the world's number one, and she's now off the team. Um, Brittany, recognizing, now has the power and the privilege to represent the U.S. because she earned that right relinquishes the spot, gives the spot over to Aaron because she says, right. you're the best skater in the world. We need to win the gold medal. I'm not going to win the gold medal. But the chance of me doing that are like slim to none. I, I, can, make, I can make the finals, but I, I don't think I can be world's number one. You're the best in the world. You're the best chance. I'm yielding this spot to you. That is how power gives itself. And it's not that Aaron didn't have power. She did because she was world's number one. And because they had proximity to each other, they knew each other. She, Aaron had proximity to Brittany. Brittany had proximity to Aaron. They knew the capabilities of, of each other. I think it would have been reversed. The, the same thing would happen because right. they would have yielded that to make a, a betterment for um, the um, the opportunity. 
So uh, I'm about to talk to um, Bonnie uh, um, Bonnie uh, Blair Krushek, who who's, uh, was the last woman to win a gold medal at the 500 meters 28 years ago. So wow. there's something that's going on with, with inside of the, the athletes that Bonnie was telling me that really is trying to push and keep this sport alive. And I think we can learn a lot from that in our business settings of how to elevate the best talent <laughs> because we we have a we have a volleyball team here <laughs> you know the volleyball right. championships and i said that's not the best talent that's out there that's the best talent of those that can pay ten thousand dollars a year to be in that talent pool right mm -hmm. so we don't open it up for a lot i would love to know your thoughts on how you see you know the the elevation how you've done that for uh, the clients that you're serving or the people that you promote inside the company to be, become like the best all the time. Right. You know, um, really the, the power is in having that servant heart, right? Yeah. To be able to place someone else's needs above your own. Yeah. And I just very rarely find that when you do that, that there's a bad outcome for you. Right. Um, any area that I've had success in in life has had to come with some sort of submission or being humble or, um, you know, trying to serve others. Yes. The way I see Valve and Meter today, our, our goals with this business, you know, I've, I've, I've had a really good run and, and created wealth and, and success. But in this journey with Valve and Meter, who will be five years old March 1st, it's not enough for me to just grow a business because yeah. I, I can do that, but I want to take a lot of people along with me in the journey. Mm -hmm. So that means clients and team members and your, the communities and organizations that we support to have impact. So on a client facing side, our goal is to 10 X the valuation of a hundred businesses. Mm -hmm. And we've already accomplished that a handful of times. And we have several clients that are on a path to do that. Um, we want to give 10% of our profits to, um, to, to not kingdom impact types of programs that break cycles of poverty, abuse, and addiction, because that's what was done for me. So we're investing there. Right. And then, um, and then we want to share 10% of profits with our team members, but we want to go beyond that. And as we grow the agency, we're going to my exit strategy. You talked about earlier exit strategies. My exit strategy is to train this team to be a, a team of givers, to have a heart for transformation um, and serving one another to reflect our core values, to grow in a healthy, profitable and, and abundant way, and then turn that into an employee stock ownership program that they would be the owners of the company. So what I'm doing today is I'm, I look at our people not to get a job done, but how will they get the job done? you know, in the next generation of folks that are here. Um, yeah. So we're trying to take clients along in the journey and our people along in that journey. Um, and that's that's very important for where I'm called to serve at today. Oh, I, I love that. Uh, and when you talk about, you know, when you power and you said, I wrote down here in servant leadership, it's it's so it's so true. Because just right after that, the, the young lady that gave that spot up, um, she Alana Myers Taylor, who's the bob bobsledder, was voted by her peers to carry the United States flag into the stadium. Right. And she comes up with COVID, so she can't do it. So she's quarantined. And who does she give the spot to? She gives it to the woman that um, Brittany Bow, who gave that spot, her team spot up. Now there was another. You know, later on we found out that. Uh, the United States got another spot for that 500 meters that the Beijing Olympic Committee opened up another spot. So she would have gone. However, you know, that gesture was you know critical and, and she was rewarded by you know, really quickly carrying the United States flag into the stadium uh, on that day. It's, yeah. it's incredible. So yeah. Mark Hassan says uh, that moment of validation from a parent is such a big deal. Really so, is, yeah. Critically. You're going to say? Really is. We had a, our, our core values here at Valve and Meter are think, love, serve, transform, and be just. And yesterday they were doing some development sessions with the team on transform. And I was not in the session, but was told about this later that one of our team members, um, Logan, was talking about when he first started 
Eva appear to him, was encouraging him. He wasn't getting meetings set for a client that he was working on. And she's encouraging him. She's that person coming alongside of him with that encouraging voice, right? And Eva, in her story, when she joined our team as a temp and has been here now four years, um, maybe close to five, probably, she was one of our first employees. When she came here, her job was to do outreach on email and phone calls, and she didn't like to order a pizza, right? So she's <laughs> she became a really good marketer here. And so she's encouraging Logan, and Logan made it, and he's a star on our team today. And his his the way he phrased it and the way it was told to me was, I succeeded because she loved me first. Wow. And we define love here in our culture as acting in the long-term best interest of another. So Eva did that. She loved well and Logan got transformation and he's transforming clients and those around him and me. And he's, he's a powerhouse for sure. Wow. Love to meet him as, as well. So I, I walk into your, uh, cause I've been out for like, uh, from the Olympic committee. That's where I used to work for 15 years and built out some, some programs. Um, but now when I'm on my own, you know, not on my own, I know God on my side or me following, I guess the, um, I go out and I start this company, this business inspired communications international. We have a vision that is to inspire worlds, not to inspire the world, but to inspire worlds because we all have impact. So if I impact somebody, then they inspire their world. Uh, and the mission is to uh, have, um, business professionals, hurdle adversity, amputate fear, embrace a new normal mindset to win life's medal. So that's kind of our, kind of our, our charge. Okay. So I walk in the battle meter and I say, help, <laughs> please. <laughs> what would be some of the things you would tell me to do uh, to, you know, people might, you know, I, they, I got a great message, but I don't know how to get it out. I don't know how to, right, right. I, they don't know me to get, get that out. What, what would you say as a, as the, the queen M? <laughs> well, I, I'll tell you, I'm blessed to work on a team of people who are really good at solving those types of questions. Um, I think um, I think there's you're doing you're you are doing good branding of yourself from what I'm seeing in your content and social media following and, and those things. You're very clear on who you are and what your messaging is and the value that you add to the world. So those are those are things that I encounter businesses that are hundred million dollar businesses that haven't figured that out yet in 25 years. Right. Wow. wow. So, um, so you've got, you've got what it takes. Right. And then it's about, and then it's, then we go into the math, you know, valve and meter does marketing on a financially accountable platform. So then we're going into the math of you can be best in the world at this, but what are your economic drivers? How much is an engagement? Um, and, and what is the, the we look at the financial model around that engagement from, cost of goods sold to gross profit to overhead and marketing costs and what is your bottom line. And that helps us to, to assess how many bullets do you have to shoot at a marketing problem? And that defines what channels you should go after. Mm -hmm. um, now, some things that we're recommending for folks pretty, um, pretty standard that you can start doing today is reviews online are really important Google reviews um for businesses and and uh, professional services so the more that you can engage people in doing a good review the easier you are found um your social media keeping your brand uniform in your different social media um places that your spaces you're playing and then um video content like i know you know things like this you're doing in video is just being picked up so much and gets so much lift on results that's usually something that that folks in the consulting type position can deploy as well. I don't know if anything that's help, helpful. Um, bottom line in all of that is you want to run tests to see what's working and then scale what is and cut what's not. So. I love it. Just got a coaching session today. That's why I had her on everybody. So I get a coaching session. <laughs> no, uh, no, I think that that, that, that helps um, so many people because I, I think there's so many people that have great messages out there. They just don't know where to start or how to stay on point. I, I saw a lot of during when, when pandemic first hit. Um, I saw a lot of, at least in my profession, right, in, in the speaker profession, in the support area of supports for um, uh, supply chain support. 
that when that kind of all crashed, everybody started scrambling like roaches to do everything else. Right. Yeah. But <laughs> what they did. Right. Uh, and so I got, I kind of got ticked off a little bit. Too, right? <laughs> um, I, I, I got ticked off with speaker, with, with the, the inspirational kind of slash motivational speaker who kind of checked out during this time when people needed to hear that voice the most. It. They needed it. Yeah. I and went they, needed, they needed the voice. So yeah. anyway, so that was, and that was, that goes back to the servant heart that you're talking about yeah. because folks were asking, you know, yeah, but they don't have my money. They don't got my. It's like, what are you talking about? This is the time to show up to help people. Right. Um, I was doing and, a webinar on recession-proof marketing to try and encourage people not to panic and what to do about the set of conditions that was in front of them. Yeah. And then I was I was ending the webinar and I didn't really have a tie down prepared and I ended up saying, "Have a great recession." <laughs> It worked, yeah. <laughs> That's hilarious. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you. I don't know. Is there a mantra that you have? I think I know it, but because we started, I think we started out that way. But um, is there a mantra that you would have that you would offer to to the listeners out here to to help encourage them and and give them a lift today, or whenever they might be listening to this this uh, this podcast? You know, I think um, shutting down that little voice in your head is important. You know, and understanding three things. You've got what it takes. Yeah. God created you perfectly for what he has in mind for you to do here. And um, you're not less than you're, there's nothing wrong with you. You have everything in front of you that can create success for you um, in your, on your terms. Secondly, you're not your past, you're your future. Mm -hmm. um, often people get stuck on telling the stories of their past and not healing the wounds of their past. And I find when I shift that to looking forward and what I'm being called to do and where my opportunities are at, I become much more effective. And then the third thing I would say is I had a, um, a very good mentor coach. Um, he was an inspirational speaker, Ed Foreman, just passed away a couple of weeks ago in his mm -hmm. 80s. And I met him about 20 years ago and, and, and he really changed my life with the things he was teaching about living a better life, goal setting and picturing a future that's better than your past. And he came in to do a, do a, a keynote at one of our conventions at Defender. And he ended up standing on my table. So it's like classroom set up and he's standing on my table. My boss is in the back of the room and he says, Dave Lindsay, Marsha is the find of a lifetime. And he looks in my eyes and he goes, you are the find of a lifetime. And he just kept saying it to Dave and to me. Wow. And I look back at Dave and Dave's like this, you know. But, you know, after that, I just kept showing up as if I was the find of a lifetime. And, you know, that that framing for me that I was the find of a lifetime in that space caused me to start to understand how to look at people that are working together with me. You know, viewing them as the find of a lifetime. They've got what it takes. You know, they're creating great futures. That mindset that you're projecting onto people is so powerful. If you're walking around your business or your classroom or your friend set and say, man, that, that's a loser and what a dud and they're not pulling their weight. Now you've put a big L on their forehead. And I could prove to you if we were in a physical setting that that becomes impossible to overcome, that, that they will pick up that whether you say it or not, they'll pick it up and uh, it'll affect them in a negative way. So you've got what you, what it takes, I think is the thing that I would, point you to today wow you've got what it takes um thank you for that that's good I'm gonna, that's the first thing i want to i want to cut that piece out and put that up today because <laughs> that is absolute gold mark hassan says again asking for a friend <laughs> well, which office dog do you think is going to win the foundies best in show award yeah I have no idea what that means but i think you do because yeah. I think you know that. <laughs> so we're a pet friendly environment here at valve meter and mark's a great great contributor on our team he's our um, accounting manager and so we have dogs in the office and on our anniversary, we have people vote for who their favorite pet is. So my pet Goldie, the cat is the reigning champ from last year. <laughs> um, so, so she won last year, he won last year, but Opa, I hope I've got that right because I have trouble remembering her name. Um, she, or maybe it's Oppa. Uh, there it's, it's close, but Mark's dog is a delightful young lady. It has a beautiful girly collar on every time I see her. And um, if she's not in the running, I would be surprised. 
<laughs> Mark, how about that for a diplomatic answer? <laughs> If she's not in the running, I'd be surprised. There you go. <laughs> Don't show side here because I'm afraid of Mark's wife who's making posters to campaign for left to win. Yeah. <laughs> that is awesome. I, what a delight. Yeah. Thank you so much. I want to wrap the show up, but uh, I just want to thank you for your time that you said yes to for, for this moment. I, I have to... Uh, um, continue the conversation offline, you know, with, with you, uh, because I, I just, I know I've learned so much from today. There's so much more I can learn. And anytime I come to Indianapolis, uh, I'm taking you out. Okay. All right. So that's, All right. That's, 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 you tell me where, and that's where we're going. So, uh, <laughs> All right. Sounds great. You got a deal. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, and everybody, uh, please give it up. Yep. Yep. That says, uh, Appa. That's right. Appa. Appa. Oh, okay. Appa right. Yep. You had it. Uh, Mark says, yip, yip. <laughs> and then uh, it's acceptable. So <laughs> your answer, I'm sure. <laughs> that is hilarious. Yeah. Uh, so, but thank, thank you for saying yes today. And uh, God bless you and your, and your company. Continue to inspire the world. Um, and we will chat with you a little bit later. Sounds great. Thanks for the opportunity to share some time with you, John. Absolutely. Thanks. Thanks, Ms. Marsha. Bye for now. All right, everybody. That is the one and only Marsha Barnes. Wow. Could you, could you, what? What incredible uh, insights and information that she just gave to us. If you if you need to, to rewind the tape, yeah, that's an old throwback, or or put the eighth track going forward to get get it. That's going to be you know for for you as well. Uh, the Global Coffee Shop coaches across the world with David Singleton and myself. Uh, the next show is going to be on St. Patty's Day in March. Uh, we come on at seven o'clock in the morning, my time here in Colorado Springs, and David's across the other side. He's in the United Arab Emirates. So he's going to be on uh, at 1800 at 6 p.m. for you non-military types over there or 1400 GMT. I have no idea what GMT means because we don't use it out here in the States. Uh, so again, on St. Patty's Day. Uh, and then the issue of Diversity Com Magazine is now out in my article, The, Va uh, the Value and Influence of the Disability Population. That is on, uh, on tap for you right now. So go get Diversity Com Magazine. And then Samantha Brown's Places to Love, PBS. Uh, we just saw the the the, uh, the show that I was able to walk her through the United States Olympic and Paralympic Museum when she came to visit Colorado Springs, Colorado, where I live right here. And we had a fantastic time. We just saw her again. She's in Brooklyn, New York, but she did a great show. Uh, so Samantha Brown's Place to Love on PBS. Check your local markets for that one. It's going to probably wind up in about 420 markets by the time it's done. It was a fantastic show. Um, and, and not just my segment, but the other ones that were around town makes me want to go and explore more of Colorado Springs. I, I, didn't, I didn't know. Who knew that we had all this stuff that was here? So, um, so yeah, so please go check that one out. And remember to be courageous. Make the jumps in your life that you know you need to make. Because when your truth outweighs your fear, you will commit to courageous life. You'll commit to courageous acts. So go forth, inspire your world for Inspired Communication International. My name is John Register saying see you next time on Hurdlers of Adversity. Bye for now.